Do you love me? Okay. So this is the love of my life, Peter Medok. I met him in Hollywood, as you do. No, uh, we met in New York. Uh, so did we meet in New York? At my cousin's dinner. It was actually in London, here. Yes, it was. It was yeah. in London, and it was love at first sight, although yeah. he has a lot of women in his life, and unfortunately, I come very low down on his pecking order. <laughs> anyway, in any case, he's one of the world's leading film directors of a certain age. Somewhere, uh, leading somewhere. Yes, and he's just finished a film on Peter Sellers. Right. And he's probably most famous for ruling class or the craze, depending on what type of film you like. But in any case, Peter, I want you, because that, this is the story I most prefer about you, is your escape from Hungary, which is really? just the most amazing story. Yeah, it was 1944, Saturday. And uh, we were having lunch at home in Budapest. And my father, uh, who was in the textile business, you know, I had my brother, my father, and my mother, the four of us. And uh, uh, the maid brought in, poured the soup pot, and she went back to the kitchen and uh, said, he said to my father, you got to come and look because they're collecting all the Jewish people in the building opposite. And, uh, and my father, we all went to the kitchen. I was seven years old then. And uh, I saw at gunpoint the Hungarian, they were called the arrow crosses, which was like the SS, but the Hungarian version of it. And they were a hundred times worse than the Germans were. Collecting all the Jews, you know, at gunpoint. And my father said, we got to leave right now. So we got up, came down this beautiful building, which is like a Viennese looking building with uh, marble steps. With... And we actually went to it together, yes, didn't we? Yes, that's right. And as we come to the front door, I saw through those enormous glass doors, a lot of shouting in the street and a man running for his life. Two seconds later, the Hungarian SS arrow crosses were chasing him at gunpoint and uh, there's gunshots and my father says whatever you do you mustn't look so we go or turn right and we go past the dead bleeding body of the priest they just killed and we get to the street corner and in the middle of the street which was a crossroad the, the germans were checking the it was called the schutz pass yes. and the schutz pass was given by raul wallenberg who was the swedish ambassador to hungary who saved thousands and thousands of Jews with this paper, which was like a free passage. So they were checking their papers and they somehow got away and crossed the road. But when we were crossing the road, I could see the vans loaded up with the Jewish people they just collected driving this way. And we got away. And then we hid next to the Gestapo in the country. In my mind, it was for years, but then in reality, it was from June till January 1945. And you lived under the SS, didn't you? Well, we were hiding next door to them, in the basement, you know. And um, the hiding meant that we had to take up a different identity and I had to change my name to Pete, from Peter to something else. And we had to go to the church every Sunday and just pretend to be Christians, you know, but hiding there. And my father was arrested several times, but he kept escaping and turning up. And my aunt, Lotte, who was this very famous soprano who lived in Albert Court yes. when I came to London in 1956, used to come in and out to Hungary, bringing food to us and stuff like that while we were hiding. Great thing about the soup bowl is that when the war was over and this little village has been taken over twice or three times by the Germans and then we went back to Budapest, Budapest as they say in Hungary, and went into an apartment building and the wall was completely blown, destroyed by a bomb, one of the buildings, and you could see out to the building but the Jews were being taken away. And then when I went into the dining room, I couldn't believe it because on the table with the four soup plates still, with the dried soup, with all the rubble which fell in front <laughs> of the thing, you know. 
and I was this big, you know, I'm looking at this table and I said, this is impossible. I mean, the whole world turned upside down and the war ended and I have all these four soup plates, you know, it was ridiculous, you know, so that's the story of the I soup I love the plate. soup, I love the soup plates. But then the incredible street about that street corner, when I decided to escape during the revolution from Budapest, with my friend Peter Varkonyi, who lived in the second floor, who was an actor, we came out the building at six in the morning, there was a curfew, and uh, they would kill anybody if you're not supposed to be in the street. There were three Russian tanks in the street, and when we came out the front door, me and Peter, the turret of the thing followed us from the front door to that street corner over there, which was the same street corner which was in 1944, so except in 44 we went that way and in 56 we turned this way. And I said to all my kids when I have had them back in Hungary and I said, had I not turned left on this corner, I said, you wouldn't be here today. Because we went back there, didn't we? Yeah. We went back to your house. Um, sort of well, about three years ago, sure. and I went, and and he said, "Don't knock, nobody." He said, "Don't knock on the door, because nobody will be in." So I said, "No, I'm going to knock on the door." So I knocked on all the pressed all the buttons, and eventually somebody opened the button, and we went in, and it was one of your oldest friends who was yeah. still living in the building. That's right. And uh, they were so happy to but see. He, well, he's a cousin of this friend of mine. That's Peter such a, Antonio, that yeah. was such a funny moment. So anyway, you got to England. Eventually, you got to England, didn't yes. you? What made you go into the film world? Because well, you know you had, it's you because had... the same aunt of mine, who was this wonderful opera singer, for my eighth birthday came back to Hungary and uh, gave me a 35 millimeter hand crank film projector. Yes. 35 millimeter. Yes and a piece of film from the Hungarian studio. Okay. Partially it was that, yeah. getting this present, you know, and then partially because my friend Peter, who I escaped with, mm -hmm. was this brilliant actor. And I always was at the theater waiting for him in the evening or a few times yeah. he made movies in Hungary during communism. And I was following the cables to try to find where they were shooting, you know. Luckily, grew up with it. Uh, when I wasn't allowed to go to school after age 13 because my father was imprisoned by the Russians and we were so-called capitalists, which we weren't, you know, but they tried to destroy the middle classes and reduce them to the level of the working of classes, you know. I wasn't fit to be educated, so I never went to school. And it was a terrible handicap in my mind. But then yeah, I was telling Camberbash last night, you know, that, that I could never catch up with the books and reading because once you miss that first 16 years or 20 yes, years of education, you know, it's impossible to catch up. You know. Absolutely. Benedict was amazed about it. And I want to make a, another film, a documentary about me arriving to England in 1956 and what it was like and how incredible Britain and the British were, you know, towards this 50,000 Hungarians who came to London or to England in, in a matter of two weeks. And it was me plus two other cousins of mine, you know, who came to England. It's seven years after the Second World War ended and what England was like, and it was the last few seconds of the good old days of England. Yes. And within one second, the minute I got to England, my aunt came and picked me up at the refugee camp, as a military camp in Tidworth. You know, immediately, I'm in Carrington House in Hartford Street, which is in Shepherd's Market in the, in the heart of London. And in the first week, my aunt said, he said, I had nothing because we all escaped without, I mean, money's been exactly. not worth anything. But my aunt said, I've got to take you to Simpsons and buy your dinner jacket because you got to come with us to the English Opera Bowl uh, at Grosvenor House. So I went, I couldn't even speak English, you know, and I went with her because she was working with Benjamin Britten on Turn of the Screw. I love, yes. And David Hemmings was the little boy in that opera. Absolutely. You know, when he was seven years old. So I went, you know, and that evening, I ended up dancing with Princess Margaret, you know, in my dinner jacket, so from, which I bought. So, so from then, a refugee camp, know, you end yeah, up with Princess yeah. Margaret. But then, ironically, there is Georgina Simpson, and here is my dinner jacket, you know, which was the first piece of uh, clothing, clothing right. I ever got. 
Amazing yeah. story. When you, when you started in film, who did you work for and what jobs did you Oh, have? my very first job was at the Social British Pathé because after one week my aunt said, OK, so I've got to introduce you to this international lawyer, Andre Bussermany, who was Hungarian, whose office was in Shepherd's Market. And then this American executive who ran Warner Brothers mm -hmm. in London, which was called the Social British Picture Corporation. So I went to see, it's, he's got this letter from my lawyer, my, my Hungarian lawyer acquaintance, and he called up immediately. It'd be incredible. I mean, he, he's a big CJ letter, was the head of the Variety Club at the time. He said, look, it's going to take me a couple of weeks, you know, and you have to join the union. And I begin, so I become an apprentice at that thing. And because the only thing I learned in Hungary is when I couldn't go to school, I studied photography and it opened my vision. And there was this one particular photographer called Bela Kalman, you know. When, when you started making films, what was your first film that you made? In Glee Place, a commercial studio, a photographer, and his name was Keith Hewitt. And he was the first person in London who started doing commercials. And so that was, so he said to me after one week, he said, come, I'll show you London from above. And he took me to Biggin Hill Airport, where he had a Cessna plane. It was the height of the petrol prices. And he took you off. Get me the plane, and off we went to London. was showing, you know, he said, there is Mayfair, there is this, there's the Parliament, and all that. But then he said, take any of the cameras from the studio and take some short ends and just go and shoot. So the first frames was me wandering around Parliament Square and uh, the Big Ben and stuff, you know, all the corny, wonderful photographs of London. But the very first movie I did was for Paramount here in London. And I found this little book called Negatives. And I had this unknown English actress who was very known on the stage which was Glenda Jackson. So we both made our very, very first movie and, together. And um, how, do, how was that received? That was received very well, though, it wasn't it? It was incredible, and it was the same time, you know, when Antonioni's Blow Up came out. So we were running neck and neck, and, and it was great. I mean, it, it started my whole life, you know, and if you really want to do something, you just you do it, it you know. And um, when you did Ruling Class, that was like a breakthrough movie. But it was because of, of breaking into musical numbers, yes, you know, exactly. which not, wasn't, nobody actually did before, but it came from this wonderful play which Peter Barnes wrote. And already those numbers were in the play, you know, and, uh, but it was fantastic. And Peter too, we were great friends. We were going to do another movie earlier, and we both walked out of that. That was the first movie I ever walked out in my life. But you've had a lot of um, drama with actors. I mean, I, lo I loved seeing your latest film about Peter Sellers. And, but Peter O'Toole, you love impossible people, really. Well, because <laughs> well, you, all, all great actors are impossible. And, you know, later on, of course, I had the luck and the joy to work with Gary Oldman. Gary is the easiest person, and the easiest other person was Alan Bates, who I worked with, you know. But all actors are difficult, you know, because uh, they are creating magic in a way. Uh, and, and they take a role and they become that part, you yeah, know. Absolutely. And that there's a certain price to pay with that, you know. I loved your, your diary that you've written, help! And, I know. <laughs> and script. disenchantment and yeah. um, dilettante. Yeah. I mean, where do you get dilettante from? Why were you thought to be I a dilettante? Why did Peter say you were a dilettante? You know, he was right. very critical. I know, but he still was brilliant. That's what I say at the end of, you know, that it was still worse to be there for one second and work with him and work with Spike, you know, who they were completely different because uh. Spike really had a heart, you know. Peter was completely heartless, you know. We ended up not talking to each other, of course, you know, but, but then a couple of years later, you know, and that's why, you know, it was very sad when he died because he had died 
several times before, particularly one time when he was doing the party or on that time, uh, he, had, he had like 14 strokes and heart attacks and it was a miracle he was alive. And that's why when he actually died, it, it was very sad because he cheated death all his life yeah. and got away with it, you know. And then suddenly he drops that and said, it's not on. But you've had a very anxious and um, emotional private life too, so yes. you've taken it into your films. At the time of doing one film, your wife is uh, committed suicide. suicide. I don't know how you carried on, on working. Ruling class, on yeah. ruling class, exactly. I don't know how you carried on working, because yeah. this sort of thing would usually affect most people. It does, life. but it did affect me, and it, it, uh, it still affects me forever, you know, yes. because those things don't go away. But you, you learn to cope with things, you know, yes. and, and as long as... I don't know, I guess, I mean, when I have to do something impossible, which I had to do several times, privately, I always thought, just think you're making a movie. I loved um, your image of your brother who died when he was young, and you yeah. said he came back. I'm always walking a borderline on disasters, and when things are really bad, something <laughs> good happens. But out of the blue, I did this wonderful film called The Changeling, which yes. is a very clean, supernatural ghost story with George C. Scott, who was an absolute giant at the time and all that. Johnny thinks and thought that The Changeling, not just him, but Scorsese and Spielberg, they all have their own prints of this film, 35 mil copies. And Martin always mentioned it in the six great movies. Yes. Well, it always had The Changeling, The Changeling. So Johnny's book was a supernatural, wonderful book called Inno Morata. So he, that's how we met, you know. And on the first day, I went to see him about two o'clock in the afternoon in his office in Los Angeles. And uh, at 10 o'clock, we were still together talking. And I started talking about my brother. And when my brother died, he had leukemia. And uh, we felt responsible for his death in a way, which I, I was not, but in my mind, I, uh, I was. But you were only and playing with him like little boys play. Well, exactly, you know. But, you, you but, know how can you, know, you say that somebody's going to die because you're well, playing no, with I them? know, but it, it uh, did hit his side and because of that he started internal bleeding and next morning he was dead. Yeah. So when you are 14 years old, kid... It's very terrifying. I mean, how do you get it out of your head? So I was telling Johnny, you know, that after my brother died, two, three months later, I was in my living room. Yes. And I was reading these wonderful books called, by Upton Sinclair called Lenny Budd. And I fell asleep and it was summer and the shutters are down like in ferries and it's pushed out so the air can come in. Yes. And uh, so while I was asleep, I was dreaming that there's a white pigeon who flew in and is staring at me. And at that second, I woke up. And I looked, and there in the windowsill of the thing with the shutters out was this white pigeon looking at me. And from that point on, I was convinced that that's my brother reincarnated, okay? So now I'm telling this story to Johnny, and Johnny goes white. He said, have you ever seen the paper cover of Ina Morata? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, can you, can you give me a copy of the book? They brought the copy, the book in, he turned it round, and the back of it was the white pigeon again. Fantastic. You know? Yes. And it was a very integral part of the plot, this white pigeon, which leads uh, the main character to where uh, the, the, the supernatural, whatever, in the book. You know? Of course, we never made the movie, but Johnny and I become like Gary Oldman, lifelong friends. And when you're working together, you if the material is good enough and it's important enough, you are really walking in each other's souls, you know, and once you experience that, nothing can come between you. I mean, exactly. you cannot let see each other for 10 years at the time, but when you do, it's back where you start. Exactly. Yeah. And so tell me about, as Gary's going to win, win. the Oscar. He's going to win Well, anyway, if he does or he to. doesn't win... Your your portrayal of Gary in your film. Yeah. Okay. What explain? In Rome, yes. Hmm. Explain the whole film. What Romeo's bleeding? Yes. What well, year is Romeo's bleeding? You know, I, at 192 Two. or something. I'm yeah. not sure anymore. Gary and I met in. I was filming in Montreal or something, 
and Gary was shooting a film in Montreal and I went to a party and I loved Gary ever since uh, Prick Up Your Ear and yes. all that, I mean who didn't, you know. And there was this bar inside, it was in the summer, and that was Gary leaning over the bar, being alone. <laughs> there was 200 people outside, but nobody inside. So I went up and we started talking, you know. And by the end of the conversation, Gary said, you know, God, you know, we got to do this movie together. And that was uh, J.P. Don Levy's um, book, you know, Ginger Man. Gary and I knew each other and he came to LA and I was going crazy, you know, and I said, I can't find a good script and I don't know what to do and, and all that. I'm going on about those good scripts and then he said, look, I was just given this script, why don't you read it? He said, I couldn't figure it out, but he said, why don't you read it? If you like it, let's do it, you know? And that was Romeo's Bleeding. Oh, okay. So that's how we met and, and you know, by then we kind of loved, we knew each other, you know, and uh, it was just heaven working together. Yes. So, so I love Jenny and yes. we love him forever. Yes. Know, because he's but you have many friends in the, in the film yes. world. And uh, how do you think Because if you've been it, directing yes. 50 years, you, you know, it, you collect all this world, you know, and, and it, 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 it what keeps me alive, you know, because I don't know anything else except how to direct. So tell me how your women in your life have influenced you. I mean, you love women, don't you? Well, I love women. I first fell in love in Hungary, but who didn't when you were young, you know, and I was 14 with this wonderful Austrian lady, girl, Heidi Brown, her name was, and she lives in Trieste today. And uh, um, Have you ever seen her again? Yes, I have, but uh, I was desperately, we were going to run away from Hungary into the world and all those uh, childish, dreamlike things. At that age, I was very shy at the time, you know, and I barely kissed her and all that, and I lost her to one of my friends. <laughs> As you do. Pierre, who, because I was studying photography at the time and he wanted to become like me. So that was my first love and then I escaped out of Hungary and, and uh, the second day in Vienna I bumped into her in Vienna with her family and everybody was getting out of Hungary during the revolution. Then, so that was a very important because that's the first love and she was very beautiful, blonde, and she had this curl in her hair. And I have a photograph of her at one of my desks. And I lost them for a long time. I saw them in London and she came with her husband to be and uh, I lost them. And one night I came back to LA and I was a little bit drunk and I got onto the computer and I put in her name and his name, which was Gilberto and Heidi Benvenuti. And suddenly this incredible hotel in Trias comes up, which is like in Venice in the main square, but a miniature version of it. I sent them an email immediately and next morning I woke up, they said, it's brilliant. We knew everything about you because of Julia, because we followed her career and we knew about whatever. And talking about Julia, you helped her a lot, didn't you, in, in when you were involved with the opera? Well, I directed her several times. I mean, no, she had me. I mean, I, it, you better it, say her name. I helped Julia. Julia McGinnis, you know. And, and she was a wonderful soprano who made the film with Placido Carmen. She was a very famous singer at the Met and, and all that. And I was doing some television and I needed an opera singer who could act. And then I looked through the camera and I fell in love with her. But it's my story of my life. But it was her hair? Huh? She's got fabulous hair, hasn't she? Fantastic, you know. Yeah. So she was my third wife, you know. And Carolyn? And Carolyn was my second wife, and that was again when ruling class I cast her in that and fell in love with but her. But she was a star at that point, wasn't Well, she, she? wasn't, particularly in England, in television, yeah. you know, and uh, she was very well known and, and all that. And then my first wife was French, you know, who you I met her? in London because. A friend of mine from Paris sent her to me that she was coming here to study English and it was around 1961 or 62, you know. We were together in London and that's when I 
went on the contract to Universal. I went to Los Angeles and I was working there. And then she came out to LA and then we got married. And my older son, Christopher, was born in Los Angeles. And a few, two, three years later, we came back to London. And then I was working at Pinewood and... I know, and I, you, sh you have a fabulous picture where you were chased down the road with paparazzi. The whole of the film world has changed dramatically yeah. in... Um, uh, it, it's so meaningless, it's just a drama publicity to sell the newspapers and all that. And all the movie stars are made into this mystical, incredible people, you know, which they are because they, most of them are brilliant actors. But I mean, in my days when I was at Universal in 63, 64, 65, I, I left my car in a parking spot at Universal because I was late from the stage and then I get this phone call are yeah, you Peter Medak, you drive a red and white DeSoto? And I said, yes, you know. He said, you mind coming to Bungalow 3, you know, and there were bungalows those days at Universal. And I go in there and I knock on the door and the secretary said, Mr. Medak, I said, yes, do you mind going in? And I go in and I open the door. It's Cary Grant. <laughs> and Cary is sitting behind his desk. He just came off the stage. He was shooting something with Leslie Caron at the time. And uh, he said, these were his words, I've never forgotten, he said, I'm curious. He said, why did you park in Dorothy Stein's parking spot? And Dorothy Stein was the sister of Jules Stein, who owned MCA in the world, Music Corporation America, who owned the studio, you know? And he said, have you seen your car? And I said, no, he said, but we got a bit of a problem because I backed my Bentley into your car. <laughs> and he said, my Bentley is okay, but your car isn't. And I don't want you to, I want you to take the car to the corner. There's a garage on Lancashire and, and um, uh, Ventura Boulevard, which is still there today. And just tell me how much it is and I'll give you the money. Don't, because your car is not worth anything, but my car, you know, gonna, the insurance is going to be a nightmare, you know. So in his room, there were all this memorabilia and on the wall there was this bicycle. And I said, what is that bicycle? And he said, that's the bicycle I rode in my circus act when I came to America for the first time. Fantastic, sorry. He said, but where are you from? And he said, I'm English. And he broke up laughing. He stood up. He said, you English? He said, I am English. He said, my mom lives in Bristol, you know. Well, you don't, you and sound, you and, don't and, sound English. So, well, of course not, you know, but in my mind, no, no, in my mind, I'm English. When I got the Evening Standard Award for the craze, uh, 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 I'm English. Richard Attenborough and, and John Mills gave me the thing and they made this speech about Hungarians coming to this country and Alexander Korda and Joel Scholte and yeah. this and that. And then I had to make my acceptance speech, you know, and everybody's there in the business, you know. I looked them all, and there were some of them friends like Jeremy Thomas and people like that who we were assistants together. And, and, and I made this speech saying, I love this country so much, which is true. And they said, I'm more English than all of you put together. <laughs> and there was this shock silence saying, he's gone finally completely insane, you know. But you but say you're English, but you live in, in Los Angeles. Well, I live in Los Angeles, regretfully, you know. <laughs> but in my soul, I, you know. But you all... love Los Angeles. You know, you've got the well, fabulous house, which includes... Yeah. I wanted to ask you something about Pinocchio. Why do you love Pinocchio? Well, no, I did a, 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 a version of Pinocchio for television with... Uh, uh, P.V. Herman, yes. who played Pinocchio, and that little thing yes. is P.V. Herman as Pinocchio, so I, I got that off the film. I wanted it I whether always it was... take something off okay. the film. I just wanted to know if it was because you like lies or are no, you interested? No, 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 no. It, was all, it was wonderful because in that Pinocchio was Carl Reiner, who played Giappato, yes. uh, uh, Jimmy Corbin, you know. Um, uh, he should explain he's got Pinocchio in his drawing room with a big, huge big, nose. Yeah. No, I love, I mean, it's big because I, I live alone, you know, and, and, and you he's always anything. there. And, the, and Pinocchio and is if reading. If I'm pissed off, I turn his head down and it's like that. No, but you and also I, get him to read. <laughs> yeah, no, he's <laughs> got a couple of, <laughs> Yeah, he's got a couple of plays always in his thing. I don't know. I mean, it's you just, just move it around. I love collecting things. And you know, Romeo's bleeding when you come into my house. Because Gary, at the end of the movie, 
uh, Lena Olin comes in and the door opens and he's singing in slow motion and there's this bell mm. ringing, you know. And I stole that bell off the set <laughs> and it's on my front you say door. You are a thief. So every time I go, of course, you know, but always just little things. Yes. And when Gary first came to see me at this apartment after we got the divorce from Julia, he came through the door and he suddenly went like, fucking hell, is the bell. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to do when you live in, in, when you first came to Hollywood, where did you actually live? At, uh, at Lar in Larrabee. But it must have been incredible in the early 60s. Oh, it was fantastic. The very first thing, when they, I got to Universal, they realized that I wasn't English. I mean, they had to be think I'm crazy to I'm English. That I was stateless still, because I become British at Milcher Boulevard, at the consulate. It took about three months or four months to get my green card. And Sid Scheinberg, who ended up running the studio, was a wonderful young lawyer at the television department. And he said to me, he said, we got a bit of a problem because the project you came on here fell through. Yeah. This is after two weeks of having got here. And he said, we want you to go back to London and we'll pay you for the year and then we'll see what happens next year in the option. And so I said to Sydney, I said, I can't go back to England. I mean, I signed a seven year contract and after two weeks, he's tell me, you know, to get on the plane, go back. Mm. So I said, let me talk to the guys, you know. Then he came back and he said, okay, we're gonna get your green card. It's gonna take a while, but meanwhile, we want you to go and observe the various productions. Tomorrow, go on stage and report to Mr. Hitchcock. So I walk on the set and I'm busy. Alfred Hitchcock for about a month and a half watching him direct Marnie. I love Marnie. With uh, Tippi Hedren. Yes, Tippi Hedren's incredible. And yeah. Sean Connery. And Sean comes on the set and he sees me. And I knew him as an assistant director. And he says to me, Hey, lad, what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, I'm going to be a director, Sean, you know? <laughs> And uh, so it, 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 was a, it was a fantastic time, I mean, for this kid from nowhere to be at the studio and no Mr. Hitchcock, you know, used to come in the morning, morning, you know, he's driven in and uh, it was unbelievable. It was luck. When I look back, I mean, I escaped in 1956 to London, you know, and 1963, seven years later, You're working with I'm Hitchcock. under contract to Universal. That's incredible. So you, when you come, when you have nothing, but you see out through the crack of the window what something wonderful is, it teaches you what, what you want, what you can have, what you could have, you awesome. know. I'm getting back to your film that you've just made at yes. the age of 80. It's your oh 80th year, and you okay. better win a prize at yeah. the Oscars. And how do you feel after having um, edited this whole... Well, I mean, the fantastic thing about it is that originally Gary knew everything about this film because anybody I really worked with who knew each other heard about this fucking disaster with Peter Sellers, which I did, Ghost in the Noonday Sun. So Gary knew about it, and one day he said we should make a film about the making of that movie, but a proper movie, not a document. Yeah. He said, but I don't want to play Peter Sellers, I want to play you, and we get somebody to play yeah. Peter Sellers, you know, so we never did it. We had a script written on it by a friend of Gary here in London and it never went anywhere. And uh, I get this message to the Academy saying somebody from Cyprus is desperate to get in touch with you, will you email him? And there was this producer in Cyprus out of the blue and he said he wants to make a film about Ghost in the Noonday Sun, a documentary of what happened because it was the most important thing which was shot in Cyprus. Uh -huh. And I said it is the last thing I want to do in my life <laughs> and to go back into this nightmare and I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it for a week or two and I said you're crazy because actually you could make a film about to tell the story of what happened and about the 70s of London and King's Road and this and that. And I thought you did that very well, actually. Wasn't that? Uh, yeah, I really loved the way that you brought back the past and put it in. It was very, actually, romantic. And I love yeah. the, the footage you found of yeah. Peter Sellers driving up oh, and down Peter the King's and those Road. Roles, you I, know. I, it makes everything look so glamorous but and I today did. so shitty. But I did, you know, so, so the, the, the thing was this, so, so that's how it came about. But, but, um, 
I was going to do Death Wish after ruling class, and I wanted Henry Fonda to play the Charles Bronson part. Bronson yes. what didn't exist at the time. And uh, United Artists wouldn't let me have him. And I got so abs pissed off, actually, not upset, that I quit, off. you know, okay. and I quit. I, did, I quit from more movies than I made, actually. <laughs> And I went back to London, and that weekend I bumped into Peter Sellers at that same spot where he's driving his car, except he was walking in front of Alvaro's restaurant. And he said, Dennis told me you walked out of your movie in, uh, from UA. Uh, he said, come and do my movie, you know, the ghost, you know, to seven to whatever. And I said, yes, and that's how the whole thing came about. I know? love the way that you got out there and the boat sunk. Yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> anyway, true. it's an amazing film that um, encapsulates the time, actually. Um, it's it's also got the ridiculous nature of all the goons, yeah, in a way. In absolutely. It. And, um, you know. uh, I love the way that you, was, that you ended the film sitting next door to Spike, cleaning up his, um, his, that, his, uh, his chair in the park. And I love that. But the incredible thing about it, oh, I've never done a documentary ever in my life. It is the greatest form of making movies. It's better than actually making movies. You said movies. it was better than therapy. But it is, because it's, it's, it's a completely free form. And there was not one word of it written. Everything, it came from nothing. And I wanted to, because I went to the cemetery, which is not in the film, except me walking down in the Jewish cemetery where Peter was cremated. And I said, I've got to go to Spike because the commercial which I made, that Benson yes, Hedges commercial, Spike donated that money to Finchley Park, you know, okay, where, yes. where his statue is. So when I turned up that morning, I had no idea what we were going to do, you know, and I asked Terry Gilliam to come there because they were inspired by all the goon shows, you know, but Terry was busy, he couldn't and all that. Anyhow, anyway, he's, it's not about Terry. It's really about Peter Sellers, yeah. the goons, you, the mess, and the nightmare of where, when a script isn't absolutely perfect. Absolutely, and John Heyman It was is, actually a lesson. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, but John Heyman's interview, there's yes. only a minuscule part of it is in, is an absolute historical lesson about film financing in England in 1970s, when he financed about 180 movies. And, and you would never think he was going to die. He looked incredible. No, I know, and it kills me every time. He said, "Why, you know, everybody's so worked. Why are you upset about this? After you must be crazy." Well, all he, you know? he actually gave you a bit of a lecture. No, he sort not. of said, "And next time, it was yeah. sort of a bit like this. Yeah. next time you'll have a proper script because yeah. otherwise you don't make a film unless of the course, script is 100 percent." And what I loved yeah, was but your the, but line, which said, I, "But I had a wife, and she was about to have a baby." I know. I know. <laughs> I had to, no, there was no way of walking out. I mean, we were all locked into this yes. incredible thing which you couldn't get off the train. But I mean, as John says, he said, it wasn't you, it was, we should never have made the film, I should have never financed it, Peter should have never paid it. He said, none of us should have done this because it wasn't ready, it wasn't good enough and all that. And well, I love it when he says you really have to have a hard on and he goes like that, yes. an erection to want to do something. And he's right. But the tragedy was I made the three perfect movie for myself, which was negative. It's which incredible. Was, it's, I wish I would be shooting it today still. A Day in the Death of Joe Egg was a huge, enormous play by Peter Nichols, which Albert Finney bought and owned. And somehow I ended up directing the movie and I was asked by Columbia, you know. And then, and the then ruling one, class happened. And ruling class. You know. And then I was going to do Death Wish, which yes. I then walked out, and then I walk into this disaster with Peter. And you lost confidence from it, do you think? Well, I know. I mean, it, it really it shook me because I felt, it, I felt responsible for his failure, which I say in the movie, yes. you know. And it was an incredible period of movies and people and... and uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I say that, you know, that both Spike and Peter were certifiably insane, but in a most divine way. Well, out of ordinary you people, know. you get ordinary things, and yeah. out of extraordinary people, you no, get extraordinary things. But I things. said uh, on it, it's not in the film, that I still love them both despite of it, which makes me more insane than the two of them put together, which is true. You know, because everybody would have just run from them and tried to forget the whole thing, but you can't. 
because they were really, I mean, Peter was a fucking genius. Thank you.